In 1968, Johnson chose not to seek re-election, and Richard Nixon won the presidency in both the 1968 and 1972 elections. During Nixon's second term, Jaworski was once again called upon to go to Washington, this time for one of the major challenges of his career. The Watergate saga began when several employees of the group working to re-elect President Richard Nixon were arrested on burglary charges. They had broken into the Democratic National Committee's offices in the Watergate building in Washington, D.C. They were caught, and the big question, of course, was what did Richard Nixon know and when did he know it? Although President Nixon was not involved in the break-in, he was accused of plotting to cover up the scandal, and he was charged with obstruction of justice. In what would become known as the Saturday Night Massacre, Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox was dismissed by President Nixon. General Alexander Haig, President Nixon's chief of staff, had been assigned the task of replacing Archibald Cox. He worked closely with federal judge Robert Bork to find a new special prosecutor on whom both sides could agree. We have to have the very best lawyer in America. I asked Mr. Bork to give me the Justice Department lists from both parties for who would be the next appointee to the Supreme Court. And on that list, both party lists, incidentally, was Leon Jaworski. The telephone rang, and it was Alexander Haig who was on the telephone. He was chief of staff at that time for President Nixon, and he called and told me that um, they had decided to ask me to serve in that capacity after Archibald Cox had been fired. They felt that uh, although he was a Democrat, that he was very conservative back in those days, conservative De Texas Democrats were more conservative than most Eastern Republicans. So they must have felt that he would come up and uh, be the kind of man they wanted. I had no ambitions along that line. I said what happened is that I was, my pulse was felt on this very thing before, uh, before Archie Cox was appointed. And uh, I then didn't think that you had given the independence to the prosecutor that he's entitled to. I finally felt that it was incumbent on me to come up there. He said, well, the least you can do is come up here and talk to us about it. And I said, well, I think you're right. I was very impressed with the fellow the minute I met him because he was clearly a, a, a very moderate person who uh, would avoid what I call extreme solutions, which is what was racking the country at that time. We knew that we called around and people gave him very high marks, lawyers, very prominent lawyers. At the same time, the White House was going through a similar process. I don't know, I don't know how they did it, but they came up with Jaworski too. So uh, he was invited up to Washington, and I met him at the White House. Jaworski took the case, thinking he would be investigating the seven employees responsible for the Watergate break-in, never dreaming the scandal would go all the way to the White House. It was inconceivable to Americans in 1974 that an American president would be tried as a criminal and forced to resign. The Watergate scandal was the most sensational political event of the era and rocked the nation from coast to coast. Well, in our house, Watergate was on the news as it was everywhere, and uh, I remember very clearly uh, hearing about the president's problems, hearing about the scandal unfolding. I remember going to high school, I was a freshman in high school at the time, and being swamped by, by teachers and principals and, and the few students who did read the newspapers, and, uh, and all of them congratulating me. And I realized then that uh, my grandfather was about to become part of a very big national story. In July of 1974, Special Prosecutor Jaworski argued the case of the United States versus Richard Nixon before the U.S. Supreme Court. His thorough investigation would eventually lead to the first and only resignation of a U.S. president. Leon Jaworski had voted for Nixon in both 68 and 72. The, uh, Archibald Cox's people that were on the staff, the special prosecutor staff, were fearful that this was going to be a fix, that Jaworski was going to cover it up, was kind of you know, brush under the table and just, you know, charge some minor functionaries with some crimes and boom, that's it. It must be very hard to have a job where you have to, uh, you have to investigate the President of the United States. Leon Jaworski's name was on, on almost everybody's lips then, as well as covered in the press, the national, the state, and, and the local press. We had promised him complete independence to conduct his own investigation and one thing I didn't want to do was to be talking to him or be on the phone to him because I didn't want any suggestion that we were in any way directing his investigation. 
Jaworski ultimately won a Supreme Court decision which forced President Nixon to turn over the infamous audio tapes in which he implicated himself in the cover-up. The tapes became the smoking gun. They were tapes of conversations in the Oval Office. There was apparently a voice-actuated recorder in the office, and when people talked in the office, he turned his cell phone and recorded the conversation. Members of his staff walk in and they see him with his head in his hands and just saying, I cannot believe that I just heard the President of the United States encouraging people to lie under oath regarding, regarding the break-in. What took a great deal out of him was finding out that the President of the United States was a crook. That took an awful lot out of him. I thought that he had been the victim of his staff, and I continued to think that until I listened to a tape recording. There were a lot of thoughts that went through my mind. One was that he was obviously guilty of something that had just absolutely uh, uh, was incredible, it seemed to me. I was not quite as upset at that moment over his uh, participating in the cover-up as I was in his instructing his uh, chief of staff, Haldeman, on how to lie when he appeared before the grand jury and still not commit perjury. This man followed the process. He set the bar exceedingly high for any future investigations of a president or of an executive branch. He basically said, we have to let the Constitution do its business, that we're here to assist. In his role as special prosecutor, Jaworski chose not to indict the president further. Shortly thereafter, Richard Nixon resigned from the office of president, and Vice President Gerald R. Ford was sworn in. Now, I think Leon, from day one, uh, conducted himself impeccably. He was an American first, and he thought about the good of the country and the good of the American people in every difficult issue we confronted. We were dealing with matters that had no precedent in, in history, we had no law books to go to, and we couldn't find anything that gave us any guiding uh, uh, light or that served as a beacon, you know, to, to where we'd know what to do. And neither could I go to the history books. It was not only that I didn't have any, anything uh, from a legal standpoint, I had nothing historically to go to. So I had to make decisions, decisions that were affecting our entire nation and, in a sense, other nations and perhaps the world at large because he was a patriot, and I think from the first day that he was there, he thought that he would be coming home very shortly, that it would, uh, that Nixon would be exonerated, uh, that the evidence would not add up to anything, and that, uh, that it would all be over. But it didn't turn out that way. <laughs>